Hi, Michael. Hello. How are you doing? I'm all right. Good. Let me introduce us. I'm Robert Wright of Blogging Heads TV, and more specifically of The Wright Show, which this is an episode of. And you are maybe I'm, not the maybe not the man of the hour, but a man of the hour. Your expertise <laughs> is uh, suddenly in demand. Is that right, Michael Brennan Doherty? A little bit, yeah. My my nerdiness You're, about ecclesial politics is. You are a papal authority, I would say. A little bit, yeah. A little and uh, <clears throat> and in addition to being a Catholic, uh, you're you're you're. Uh, you're you're pretty well. Uh, you're pretty knowledgeable about the Pope. In fact, you wrote a piece for Slate about this uh, after Pope Benedict, Benedict announced that he was stepping down. Um, so there's just about nobody I would rather have enlighten me as to what the meaning of all this is, Michael, okay. than you. Um, and you're now uh, your current affiliations with the American Conservative, I think. Yes, I'm a national correspondent for the mm -hmm. American Conservative, and I've been my work's been appearing. Well, in Slate, as you mentioned, uh, mm -hmm. most recently, and also in ESPN magazine, which mm -hmm. is less interested in the Pope than than I hoped. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> what, what what were they interested in that you wrote about? I was just writing about sports stuff. Oh, really? Do you, I didn't realize that you're uh, you're a little bit of a sports writer. I'm I'm trying to be a little bit of what. What sport? What sport? I want to write about hockey, but so far I've written about uh, a quarterback in the NFL. <laughs> well, you're you're moving in the right direction. Um, the the head injuries are possible in both sports, for example. Yes. Um, uh, okay. Well, good luck with that. I wish I knew enough about hockey to follow up, but I grew up mainly in the South, and hockey really is not is just not a big thing there. No, no, not at all. Um, so uh, on this Pope business, now. I mean, first of all, is it still a little bit of a mystery why he's stepping down? Is there is there a known infirmity? There's not a known infirmity. It's just that he cited his declining mental and physical health, mm -hmm. uh, or his mental and physical capacity. And it has been known, for instance, last year during the Easter week, that the the tasks that a pope is expected to perform. Uh, were extraordinarily draining on him, mm. um, and uh, you know it took him a while to recover. So, mm. and you know, as some of the reporting has shown, he, he's kind of hinted at this eventuality for himself. But it's still, it's still a shock. Um, mm. You know, it doesn't. I mean, this hasn't happened. In six in, centuries or so? Yeah, since well before America was discovered by the Europeans. So, uh, Right. Now, do you think maybe it's, it's a healthy precedent in the sense that in the modern age of medicine, it's, it's common to keep someone alive well past the age where they are very mentally agile? So maybe, you know, this didn't become an issue so much before modern medicine, but, but now maybe you're going to have to get in the habit of easing some popes out of office once, you know, they're no longer, uh, their mental life is no longer what it was, but they're still alive? Right. There is, I, I think it is potentially a good precedent for exactly that reason. You know, there's talk that, um, you know, John Paul II supposedly had a letter of resignation prepared that sat with a secretary in case he was really completely mm -hmm. out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's talk that Pope Pius XII in the uh, 1940s and 50s was, you know, basically a victim of quack medicine and, and was basically uh, incapacitated uh, near the end of his life. So mm -hmm. I think this was an eventual. This was eventually going to come to a head, and, and I think maybe uh, maybe Benedict is the one to trust to establish it as mm -hmm. a precedent. I mean, because everything he does from now until he dies. Is a precedent. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and he seems to be doing the right thing, right? Emphasizing how how insulated he will be from everything that follows? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's it's difficult. You could imagine a case where, say, if John Paul II had done this in the year 2000 or 1997 or something like that, mm -hmm. um, because John Paul II was such an enormously charismatic and popular pope, uh, you can imagine it being very difficult on whoever mm -hmm. his successor would have been. 
mm -hmm. that there would have been a sense of if someone was unhappy with the current pope's decision they would be looking at uh his predecessor for some kind of approval of it or, mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. and i actually do think this that that dynamic could become something that that we experience in our lives now it in the future uh, mm -hmm. if we have one really popular pope and then an unpopular one and um so huh. i think i think there's a dangerous edge to this precedent where um if you think about like the uh, prince charles in england you know there's talk like oh will he uh just let himself be skipped over because his son is so much more popular mm -hmm. the problem with that is it really does set a precedent where you have are you saying that if you're unpopular, if you make an unpopular decision, if some set within or outside of the church doesn't like you, you should just hand it over? So, mm. I, so I think I, it's a little bit of uncharted waters, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay, and in terms of, uh, you know, how much it matters like that that he will no longer be the pope and that and, and, and how much it matters which person is selected to be the next pope um i gather that some of us may be in for a disappointment you know in the sense that the average total outsider like me who knows barely nothing uh, barely anything about you know the papacy or anything <laughs> um, you know what we have in mind is well uh, are they going to change the doctrine on contraception, on married priests, on female priests, and on and on and on, on homosexuality, you know, yeah. and, and things like that. And, and um, I, I gather your view is that those of us who expect the next pope to make a difference on that scale misunderstand something? Yeah, so, um, and you have to be careful sorting through the different issues. So, mm -hmm. for instance, um, a married priesthood is possible. For that is possible within ten years or something. That's conceivable. It's it's po it, it is theoretically possible. I don't think it's plausible. I, I don't think I don't think it's possible in the sense of um, it's a likely eventuality. I just mean mm -hmm. it's possible as in theoretically it could be done in the Catholic Church. And is it within the powers of the Pope to make it happen? It is, yes. Okay. Uh, now, the so, other questions you brought up, you know, when Pope Paul VII affirmed against his panel of experts that contraception was immoral and sinful, mm -hmm. his language was, it was always immoral and sinful. It is intrinsically immoral and sinful. It will always be immoral and sinful. Mm -hmm. I literally, he does not said that he did not have the power to change it. He's not like an executive of Catholicism setting policy in that regard. So, is it because uh, of this prior declaration by a pope who is considered infallible that? No overruling is possible by a subsequent pope? Or no, is that the reason? No, no, no. Actually, infallibility never came into it. Um, or it, when it, papal infallibility never came into it. The teaching on morals, on, mm -hmm. on the moral teachings of the church, do not change. They. This is an inherited inheritance that the pope is supposed to guard and safe keep. And so there's no, it's not like a Supreme Court decision either, where there's like a precedent set. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, okay, but the only moral teaching of the church that I think I've, you know, you could say has changed is the one on usury. Um, but I, that is such a complicated case, mm -hmm. it's almost not worth getting into the weeds. Okay, of. but on this contraception business, I mean, you could say the moral laws don't change, but in fact, was anyone, was it, was it considered to be the case before this papal declaration that contraception was a no-no? Or did he just assert something that ah, nobody ever noticed, there's <laughs> no evidence of it, but once he says it's always been the moral law of the church, no. then that's the case or what? No, not quite. Um, okay. So the chemical contraception was, was obviously a new invention. Um, okay. You know, different from, I mean, previously, right. like, chemical 
uh, or supposed chemical contraceptives or, or abortifacients uh -huh. are just labeled kind of broadly under the term witchcraft, you know, for, I see. for about a thousand years. Um, but no, it wasn't like some new teaching. And I have like my old catechisms from the 1920s or so that affirm that birth prevention with the language of the time uh, was okay. immoral, etc. Except for rhythm, the rhythm method. The, right. Yeah. Yeah. The not entirely reliable rhythm method. So, so that that so that goes back centuries. Then is that is yeah? That right? And you can even okay. find actually, you can even find Protestant reformers like John Calvin and Martin Luther condemning um, birth prevention or the sin of Onan or you know uh -huh. on and on. Uh, okay. Meaning exactly so, that. So that's not something. That's it, not going to change. So if so, being a human thing. If a pope issued a statement saying contraception is moral, mm -hmm. he would be wrong. He, it's not like okay. he, he... And if he tried to say, I'm exercising my infallible authority as the universal teacher of all Christians uh -huh. to say this, he would create an unbelievable crisis in the church, unlike its face since before the Reformation. I mean... Okay. It, it would be massively destabilizing. Okay. Um, so then, so far, the count is married priests, conceivably. Yeah. A change on contraception, no way. Right. What about female priests? No, uh, that's no. John Paul II when he put his letter out about that in the '80s when it became a live issue within Catholic circles. He said that he doesn't have the authority to do that. You know, it, it was again one of these things where this is part of the inherited deposit of faith would be the mm -hmm. term that they use. And was uh, it his declaration of the fact that he didn't have the power that made it undeniable that a pope doesn't have the power? Uh, no, it doesn't. It, that doesn't make it undeniable. It's just, it's the basically when popes teach mm -hmm. you know, you give it authority in the sense that it's consonant with the constant tradition of the church. It's only on these rare, spectacular occasions that they invoke their kind of special, infallible teaching authority. Um, in fact, it's only really been invoked explicitly twice in history. Uh, mm -hmm. Otherwise, Catholics are just supposed to consider what the Pope says. If it's, if it's consonant with the Catholic faith that's been handed on down for centuries, then believe it, it is trustworthy. Okay. If, it, if it's not, if you're not sure, it, you owe it some respect uh, and if it's speculative, you don't. I mean, okay. or if it's on a, a matter that he's not competent to speak on, you don't have to believe in it. You can disagree with him. Okay. And then what about homosexuality? No, no hope for change there either. There's probably no hope for change there. I, I, I no, I, I don't see it's it's embedded in the scripture too, and in the tradition of the church. I mean, mm -hmm. it, you just. You I mean, so. Correct. It seems to me this is all uh, potentially a problem for, for a church uh, that wants to remain robust in certain socioeconomic circles and in certain parts of the world, right? Yep, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and, and I guess, I mean, you might say that there's a, there's a problem. Once you go global in the modern, in the modern world, you almost face that problem anyway because you're the different constituencies, if you really would like to convert the whole world to your faith, then your different constituencies in different places and different cities and different parts of different cities are going to be so different that you just, you know, there, there, may, there will be tension among those things. So I would imagine that the homosexuality issue is not such a hindrance for church proselytizing in some parts of the world right, right now, but it is in others. And so... Um, you know, it seems like any church uh, that, that wanted to proselytize globally would face trade-offs, possibly. And I guess in this case, maybe these doctrinal constraints kind of settle the matter in some cases, if you know what I mean, right? It's like, well, focus on the global south, you know, or, or whatever. Do you see, you know? Yeah, I think that I think that's possible. I, I think there's still a desire uh, among higher ups in the church to look at Europe and the Americas um, because they, many of them are from there still. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, and Pope Benedict, when he became Pope, talked about Europe as a mission field for the church uh, in a way that it hadn't been before. So I don't think they want to give up entirely, uh, but it's, it is very clear that, you know, nearly half of the world's Catholics are in South America. Um, an, another enormous portion is in Africa. Mm -hmm. you know, it's growing in the subcontinent, growing in Asia uh, a little bit more slowly. And the statistics in Europe and America are decline, uh, disillusion, you know. Um, as I was saying, in, from 1965 to 2002, two-thirds of the seminaries in America closed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a decline of 90% of mm. seminarians. So now there's a, I, I think there's an irony here in your interpretation of the matter, right, which is that I think you blame for some of this decline in the kind of what you might call the more modernized part of the world. You actually, I think, attribute, uh, unless I'm wrong, to the, the parts of the Second Vatican Council which was actually an attempt to modernize church doctrine. Yeah. Right? I mean, you, I, I think you think that in some respects remaining more conservative in some respects than the Second Vatican was uh, would actually have been better for the church in North America, right? Yeah, I think, I, I, I don't think all of the decline that they've experienced could be prevented. And I don't want to um, suggest that the 1940s and 50s were this. Uh, period that we shouldn't criticize in the church. Um, even though in the first half of the 20th century you had amazing literary personalities converting to the church, etc. You know, you had this mm -hmm. rich life, I think, um, happening. But I would say the Second Vatican Council's con contributed to doubt about the faith of the Catholic Church. And it's partly because any ecumenical council, I think, uh, because it's such an it's an invocation of such extraordinary authority in the church, mm -hmm. it seems to put things up for grabs. And in the wake of the council, um, in the years afterward, they reformed the mass dramatically. I mean, so it was no long it was no longer in Latin, and I think right. And some people think that that drained it of some of its kind of mystical appeal. Or I think so too. It also, I mean, they actually changed the words of the mass mm -hmm. in many cases. They changed the prayers. So it wasn't just a translation. It was, it was a total rewrite mm -hmm. in a sense. Um, and they, they rewrote it based on scholarship about the early church, much of which has turned out to be pretty bad. Hmm. Um, that happened. Then also disciplinary matters in the church changed where, you know, the prohibition of meat on Fridays, etc. Mm -hmm. All these other distinctives went away. You know, even right. women wearing mantillas to church, covering their heads, just lots of different distinct distinctives. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, I think, contributed to a loss of faith. It also emboldened a lot of theologians and priests in the church who don't did not believe in traditional church doctrine to kind of state their case and. Mm -hmm. And they did so, uh, but it's just, um, if, if the Second Vatican Council's goal was to open the church's doors to the world, uh, people walked out rather than in to the church. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, just as a matter of raw accounting and fact in the West. Uh, maybe some of that would have happened anyway, but it, it certainly did happen. Did it accelerate at the after the Second Vatican? I, it's just there's a, a wealth of reported material on just the dissolution of communities of nuns, priests, religious mm -hmm. orders uh, happening almost immediately. Hmm. Um, because it, among some, there was even disappointment that the council didn't go much further. Mm -hmm. So there were people that maybe entered the priesthood and thought, oh, well, we're in this period of change. I'm going to be able to get married, etc. cetera. Mm -hmm. I can expect this or that. It didn't happen. And then they leave. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think the council documents were, uh, in many cases, vague or self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. And, um, it, you know, the other thing is, too, I don't expect average modern people to be interested in reading church documents. So the, the changes at the council 
that people experienced were the change of the mass, the change of all these other things. Um, you know, they didn't, they weren't looking to the theoretical logic behind it. Right. Um, so I, I'm skeptical that people even would have been attracted to the church that wrote those documents. And some of the, some of those documents are totally weird sounding now. There's one Gaudium et Spes that, I mean, it literally is like returning to Woodstock or to a production of hair. It's, it's so off the wall. Um, I, I, it's almost impossible to make anything of it now. Uh huh. So any any anyway. Sorry. The, the uh, you know one of the this is kind of tangential, but to me one of the more striking and kind of amazing uh, results of the Second Vatican, as I understand it, did it leave open for the first time the prospect of salvation for non Catholics and non Christians? Okay. It it definitely it gave a full expression to that, uh, which has been part of church teaching for a long time. So there's, there's, think of that in two poles. There's a pole of Catholic theology that says, outside of the church, there's no salvation. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, a pole that says, of course, God can save whom he wants to. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you read St. Augustine, he says, the church has some that God does not have. God has some that the church does not have. Mm -hmm. And so there's this way of thinking about it, and this can be confusing to people, that um, there's a theology at the time of the anonymous Christian, that there are people that, if they act in accordance with the graces they are given, which may not include ever hearing about Jesus or Catholicism or right. anything. Uh, in fact, some people are given such a warped image of religion that you maybe they should never be expected to be attracted to it. And so you... you take that understanding of the flaws of humanity and you say, okay, if that person is of goodwill, if they cooperate with the grace that God is giving them in whatever mm -hmm. form he's giving it to them, they are, in a sense, members of the church. They are cooperating with God's grace as much as they can in their lives, even if that grace never leads to baptism and the sacraments and okay. the mass, etc. So, but the... Second Vatican Council put a lot of emphasis on this. Um, and for some people, it seemed like a signal that, oh, well, in my mind, I don't think these church doctrines make sense. I will find my salvation outside of the church. Right. So it did act as a kind of, hmm. you know, maybe a permission slip. I mean, in a way, it's a natural accommodation, again, of a modern globalized world, because now that you're aware of all these other cultures, you know, and if you see some really good Buddhist devoting his or her life to, you know, helping humanity and living what, in normative terms, is a holy Christian life, the ideal Christian life, it does seem a little odd to say, well, I'm afraid he's going to have to go to hell because he wasn't in a country where somebody told him about Jesus. In that sense, you know, it, it, it makes sense to me as an accommodation of of the times, but I understand how it, you know, in a, in another sense, drains some of the authority from the church. Right. And, you know, I want to emphasize, this really was a concept that goes way back. I mean, if you look at the carvings in the Cathedral of Chartres in right. France, you know, started in the 11th century, um, they have carvings and, and statues of Euclid and Plato and Aristotle, who... Mm -hmm were known... Not good Catholics. As we yeah. Know, yeah. They were no non-Christians. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it did seem to... The, the spirit of the time was, you know, a diminishment of... It seemed to be a diminishment of what had developed in earlier centuries with the announcement of the doctrine of papal infallibility at the First Vatican Council mm -hmm. of a church that was supremely confident uh, that it was the only source of salvation for mankind, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. So um, that's part of it. And you can't talk about Benedict's papacy or John Paul II's papacy without talking about the Second Vatican Council at least a little bit because they were men at the council. Uh, mm -hmm. Benedict was a liberal, considered a liberal advisor at the council. Um, you know, and in many ways, he kind of remained a mid-century Catholic liberal, Hmm. even as the world kind of shifted around him. So why is he thought of as so conservative? I mean, you're saying that's a misconception? Uh, I would say he's he has moved a little bit, um, I think, uh, since his 
60s self. Um, but uh, the world has, I think, moved almost much more. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, th- there's just this sense of, um, you know, in the 1960s, obviously, the average liberal wasn't thinking, oh, let's have gay marriage. It, it just wasn't on their mind. Right. Um, so now that it is, Pope Benedict seems much further out of step with the times than he did in the 60s. Mm-hmm. But Benedict was, at least in within the Catholic Church, he was sort of, after the council, he was in the middle, so to say. There was mm-hmm. a progressive wing out of the count, that came out of the council that said, no, we need to push more. You know, maybe the priesthood itself doesn't really have to exist the way it does. Um you know, and if we push further, we can achieve unity with Protestant denominations, etc. And then there was a traditionalist wing, which I'm a little bit more sympathetic to, that said this was all a mistake. Mm-hmm. And and Benedict has tried to, I think one of the missions of his papacy was to try to settle this debate once and for all and say, no, the Second Vatican Council is a part of the broad tradition of the church, and it must be read in that light. You know, it's not mm-hmm. it, because both the progressives and the traditionalists said that Vatican II was a break with the past, mm-hmm. um, and deplored it or celebrated it by turns. And and Benedict is saying no, it it should not be seen as a break. Anything that looks like a break should be repaired, and we'll move forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'll see. I think he, I think this thing, and he calls it the hermeneutic of continuity, which is basically a fancy word for saying like the rule or the interpretive tool of continuity. Um, that has gathered under his papacy a lot of intellectual currency within the church. Um, and, and probably, and it has currency among several of his potential successors. Mm-hmm. But it, its upshot is just to affirm and consolidate the effect of the Second Vatican Council, basically. and and. Yeah. Yeah, and, they, and, and kind of, I mean, is it almost a little like uh, like Richard Nixon with respect to the New Deal and the Great Society? In other words, somebody who's thought of as conservative comes in, and they just don't fight that stuff, and it's increasing, you know? I mean, and so, so yeah. I don't know, maybe, maybe there's a better example in politics, but you know what I mean. It's a, it's a, someone who's thought of as a conservative affirms a doctrinal, a set of doctrinal uh, changes that are thought of as, as liberal. Right. And and at the same time, he's tried to say that some of the wildness that happened in the Catholic Church in the 70s, I mean, some... Okay, okay. so that was overshooting. He's on the one hand saying the Second Vatican was fine, but he's saying anything that goes beyond it is too far. Right. I mean, because some people watching this may remember if they're older than me. In the 70s, you could go to church, some churches, and they'd be very traditional, but you could go to other ones and they'd priest would say, okay, bring something to church, like a rock or a stone. Now give it to your neighbor. Now do this. Okay, now we're going to go play Peter, Paul, and Mary on the guitar. Uh, we're going to throw our confessional into the town dump. We're going to throw out the altar. Mm-hmm. And he's kind of saying there was there were excesses after the council, uh-huh. and he's trying okay. to hem them in a little bit. Okay. Um, so- but also, I would say that they're hemming themselves in. I mean, the, the temperature of the church has changed in the past 30 years as well. I mean, a lot of a lot of people who disagree with the church's teachings on morality have just have just left. Mm-hmm. They're not in the church to influence anymore. And in, and in that way, I think a lot of liberal Catholics feel orphaned, you mm-hmm. know, that, that, or that they or that they lacked potency. They, that they didn't have any children mm-hmm. within the church. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's there aren't successors to the real. Um, progressive theologians. Okay, uh, so, so, so speaking of liberal Catholics, what, what do you think is the most that a liberal uh, Catholic can realistically hope for from the next pope? Let's assume the liberal's dream is realized and whoever the most liberal candidate is, uh, is, is the most plausible liberal candidate is, is selected. Um, uh, we've already said that, okay, um, a married priest, to, married priest, that's conceivable, if not likely. It's at least within the power of the Pope, not totally out of the question. What other things could a liberal uh, hope for semi-realistically? Um, I think what a liberal Catholic could reasonably hope for 
is a continuing um, diminishment of the papacy itself. Hmm. And there was this concept kind of articulated at Vatican II of collegiality, that bi individual bishops in their areas, in their regions, have some real authority and real autonomy um, that they're responsible for. And so I think if, and, and this is a concept that appeals to um, Catholics who are interested in maybe ecumenical relations with the Eastern Orthodox churches, mm -hmm. uh, because those churches fear uh, an overweening papacy. So I think if you're a liberal Catholic, you would hope for that and then hope that your individual bishop has room to be a bit more liberal about things. And what's uh, an issue where that could matter? I mean, it would matter on things like, uh, I mean, you're seeing a move by conservatives in the church to, to strike out such things like altar girls. And you're seeing, so I would say it would just be a, in a sense, you would get, a liberal Catholic would get priests and bishops maybe who just, I wouldn't say suppress the conservative social issues, mm -hmm. but don't emphasize them as mm -hmm. much, and instead emphasize social justice issues, etc. Um, okay, you know, and 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 just bring that out. There is the possibility that you know someone like Cardinal Schoenborn, mm -hmm. uh, if he's elected, I mean, I think the possibility of the kind of crisis I talked about before is uh -huh. po is possible i mean he's he's been a little bit mavericky so to say so for instance in his diocese in vienna there was a priest who removed uh, an openly homosexual man from a parish council schoenborn intervened and reinstalled him and, hmm. and basically punished the priest wow um yeah so th that may be something and he's and he's considered very popular among cardinals um that particular incident might come up as they start discussing among themselves who they might elect in the in the next month or so but but i, but I, I don't see him listed as among the most likely that you as you have i, I think you did this thing in business insider right where you yes. where they, they ranked him he's yeah. not very he's not very high up on the list right he's, in terms he's of not very high up but he's absolutely a possibility I mean, okay it, there is no front runner Right, uh -huh. now, right now, and, and I've talked to people even since I wrote that, who have the ear of cardinals, and um, it's very difficult to predict these. And no one went in predicting John Paul II. No one went in predicting uh, Joseph Ratzinger would become Benedict the Sixteenth. Mm -hmm. um, it was so. There are instances where you just can't know going in, and I think that's especially true with this conclave. Um, so I, it's very difficult to tell. I mean, there's a strong block of Italian electors, but there's even talk among them that their preference is for a non-European. Um, mm -hmm. so, but at the same time, there's questions about the qualifications of some of the non-European candidates that are being talked about. Um, so there's one from Ghana who's uh, commonly mentioned, and of course that would be consistent with the church's expansion into non-European uh, areas. But and, um, and that, actually, that could be a hope for some liberal Catholics too, in the sense that Peter Cardinal Peter Turkson from Ghana. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, he's ex he's extremely conservative about religious distinctives, right? So he says Catholic Church, Catholic faith is true. No other religion is true. Other religions are not only false, but some of them very dangerous. On the other hand, I mean, he is very far to the left, we would say in America, on economic issues and policies. And he's a, a outspoken critic of Western economic policies in mm -hmm. Africa and in the third world. Um, so if, if Benedict was slightly, and, and this was a subtle part of his papacy, he was slightly to the left of John Paul II on those issues too. Mm -hmm. uh, Peter Turkson would be much further out. Uh, okay. So there, there could be a real social justice element to the papacy in the near future where you have a, a, a pope from Ghana surrounded by Italian cardinals denouncing American and British bankers. Uh, <laughs> which, by the way, could, 
could be scary uh, in its own right. Um, For some people, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would still be able to sleep at night, personally. Right. Um, the, and who do you have a favorite who so I mean first of all okay so for social justice for left for liberal in the social justice sense you'd like Turks and of Ghana possibly on social issues including homosexuality a liberal might like Sharon Bourne of Austria yeah um, but who do you have a, a favorite or, or, or somebody um, or and or somebody that uh, conservatives might like um, there it's harder I mean for for me personally, if they've ever celebrated the traditional Latin Mass since mm -hmm. since the end of the Council, I would say that's a good sign for me. Okay. Uh, and there are about 12 out of the 117 cardinal electors that have. And it's likely to be one of the, the electors that gets elected. Um, however, I would say there's... I think I, I've become attracted to, and he's become a very serious candidate, uh, Marc Ouellet from Quebec. In Canada, yeah. Um, he's extraordinarily well qualified, you know, speaks six languages. He's considered very polished. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Dolan has been talked about on the fringe, but he's considered a little gauche, a little too American. Not really. It doesn't have the politesse. Well, it isn't a being American, period, you know, a, a, a problem? I mean, I heard that on the radio. Some, somebody said it's almost impossible that they can choose an American because just the idea of taking kind of leading, you know, the political, some would say imperial power in the world, you know, and drawing your pope from there is just too at odds with too many places where the church would like to get traction or something. Is that That, that is absolutely the reason why an American wouldn't be chosen. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's not impossible. It's not. I don't think it's impossible. I just think it's very unlikely. Um, so Mark Ouellette is, is a very interesting one. There's also a candidate, um, a Spanish candidate, uh, Cardinal Canizares Lovera, who's known as Little Ratzinger. And, um, and notably, Mark Ouellette contributed to the jur theological journal that Cardinal uh, Ratzinger founded after the Vatican II Council. Mm -hmm. So... Those two candidates would sort of signal continuity, and I think they've become more likely now that Benedict is still alive while they're doing the choosing. Because uh. um, I do think the cardinals are well aware of the, the of what people understand as the gaffes of this past papacy mm -hmm. or the missteps, but they are, I'm told, much more forgiving of them because they elected Benedict knowing that he was an academic, but also very aware that the church was in deep disorganization and dysfunction uh, at the highest levels, and that anyone who began trying to set things right was going to meet opposition and scandal and difficulty. Mm -hmm. um, so I think they have a much more forgiving attitude towards Benedict than I think the press does. Okay. And so if this, uh, the person who's actually listed as the front runner in this uh, Business Insider piece, the, the Ouellette or whatever, the, the guy from Canada, <laughs> yeah. um, we, we would, in that case, you would expect kind of n not really much in the way of conspicuous change, period? I don't think so. I mean, popes do surprise, right? Mm -hmm. So the expectation the world had of Benedict was, okay, he's older, and he's going to be this caretaker. And he was in some sense, but he made more dramatic moves than people expected and more risky moves, you know. So mm -hmm. he, he really tried to heal the rift with the traditionalist critics of the council, and he really got burned for doing it, um, both by the traditionalists and by everyone else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he, he liberalized the use of the traditional mass, or liberated its use in reality, um, those were bigger, more authoritative, and bolder moves than people expected. Uh, I think a lot of people just expected him uh, to just try to fix the management of the Vatican itself, which was mm -hmm. in total disarray at the end of John Paul II's papacy. Um, so he's he's been a bit of a surprise. And, you know, John the Twenty Third, when he called the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, he was also considered 
a guy that was going to be a little bit of a caretaker after the enormous papacy of Pius the Twelfth. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there are there is room there are is room for surprise, and sometimes it seems that candidates for the papacy they don't. It's not like a campaign where you say, "This is what I'm going to do once I'm in." Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's much more close to the vest than that, and and the electors themselves are guessing and looking for hints in their resume or in their past, just as much as we are. Okay. So there could, you know, who knows? There could be a big shocker, and you know, maybe uh, some people are talking up these uh, ancient prophecies of uh, Malachi that say that this will be the last pope before it's all over. You mean the next one will be the last one? Yeah. Well, then they then they better get it right. <laughs> um, and, uh, well, thank you, Michael, so much. This has been very illuminating. And thanks for your uh, your numerous other past appearances um, on Blogging Heads. Oh, thank you. I hope, I, hope it, I didn't get everyone too far into the weeds and the reeds. Well, if you did, I share the responsibility. Um... <laughs> but proudly, because I enjoyed it. Um, so we'll have to have you back on the next time a pope resigns, but ideally sooner than that. Ideally, not you know, it won't take another six centuries before we yeah, have you on. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe, the <laughs> maybe, then again, technology, maybe we'll all be still alive then. Maybe that's why the next one is the last pope. And it, that, that would explain it. You know, the deal on that is, people don't realize how, in theory... <laughs> In theory, this can happen. I mean, once, you know, life expectancy has been increasing. Once life expectancy is increasing faster than one year per year, you're set. That's right. That's a, that's a very good point. You're set. That's all we need to get to. Of course, though, this could be, this could be disaster for the Catholic Church, right? Because what if that one year per year happens at the moment the Pope has gone senile, but has not given someone a letter of resignation. We There's that have, problem. We would have to have a papal murder. You know? There is also the problem in terms of uh, the sales pitch that the Christian Church uh, generally makes to people. If there is no death, there is no afterlife. So the promise of you know saving your soul just isn't what it might have otherwise been. I imagine that they would still have car accidents and things, right? And you, you make a good people. point. So it would be kind of an insurance policy in the unlikely event that you should die someday. It would be interesting to know. I mean, we're going off topic as we're getting off the phone. You think? It would be interesting to know how people's attitudes towards war and political change and accidents would change once life expectancy is infinity. Like, how much more of a disaster would war, yeah. Or, how much more appealing would war be in the sense of, okay, once we fight this revolution, it's over, it's established, we've established it, our heirs will not overthrow it, so we've got to go now. Uh-huh. I don't know, it, it's hard to say. It is hard to say. Um, and, uh, but we may be around to say it, and to see it. Um, well, you you have a much better chance than I do, I'm afraid, from my <laughs> point of view. Um, <laughs> but in any event, uh, we will leave it for our commenters to settle this particular issue. Um, but thanks, thanks again. And people can also uh, you I, I notice you also show up on up with Chris every once in a while. I've noticed, which is yes, I might I might be there this weekend. And that and I would just point out you were on Blogging Heads before you were on up with Chris, as was Chris, in fact. I mean, not to get possessive here, but as was Chris. That's right. No, I'm just and saying this could be a stepping stone to great things. Okay, it is. It is. Well, I was on Blogging Heads, then went on up with Chris, and then because I was on up with Chris, I was on Bill Maher, and uh, and it all began with us. Do we get royalties? No. Am I bitter about that? No. It's fine, really, Michael. It's fine. <laughs> it's all right. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much, and take care. Okay. See you around. Okay. Bye. Bye. -bye.